Hey everybody, Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols here, and we're not doing a tactical fitness report. Um, I have another segment that I've been doing, probably done about a dozen of them. I call them two through and after, and where I interview somebody, and, and typically these are former Spec Ops members um, that are now civilians and in their own business and doing great things. So we're going to listen to Jeff Nichols' story today on... Um, just his whole journey of where he was when he was a kid, long before he was in the military, and then making that transition into the military, and then what he did in the military, some fun stuff there, and then we'll um, talk a little bit about what he's doing now in the future. So that is what two through and after is all about, Jeff. Deal. Yeah, I'll, try, I'll, I'll do my best also to keep it abbreviated because uh, I, I think, you know, we kind of talked a little bit off camera. There, there's so many of us, like, I get asked, like, hey, how did you become a strength coach? Like that, that journey for many strength coaches is very similar. In the yeah. same regard, that journey for most guys, especially what we know as buds and the guys in the SEAL community, so many of us like are like came through this pattern of like, huh, I could totally relate to that. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this little epiphany that goes yeah, on. Yeah. Like, like, okay, huh? that kind of happened to me and so, many, and so many of us, right? In yeah. different parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it makes you a little more relatable to the average kid, especially the hard gainer. Cause I know a little yeah. bit of your story. Yeah. And, uh, so let's get started. So who were you Jeff Nichols uh, before you joined the military? Man. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's interesting. Cause I, I wish I wish my best friend since third grade was here, Corey Stanley. And he could answer that. Cause like very few people really have known me that long. Um, and he's still one of my closest friends, but uh, long story short is I grew up in a very small town and literally on a dirt road in Iowa population, less than a hundred people. Whew. Um, the, the town I grew up in, I guess you want to call it, I went to school and about 4,000 people there now, maybe five. Um, but I'm in close proximity to like the University of Iowa and some bigger towns, that, you know, as I say towns, cities, if you will, <laughs> relative to Iowa standards, it only has a population of like 7.5 million, right. which is like New York City. <laughs> right. So yeah. um, anyway, so very small town, mom and dad, like I grew up in the Partridge family. Uh, I tell people that I mean, I my, my father passed away a couple of years ago. My parents were married for 43, 44 years, like legitimately happily, you know, like, you know, it's for, for what I could surmise. Yeah. Um, I have a sister, small town still, um, very, very successful in her own right. She is. Um, and, uh, anyway, my, my childhood really is just, it can be summarized in a few things. GI Joe transformers, baseball and swimming. That's kind of like how I grew up. It was like, I living in a rural place, it, I, not having this community around me, I had to have a very good imagination. I, I grew, I played by myself most of my childhood. Yeah. Um, I certainly had friends around at time in school and things like that, but my parents worked a full time jobs each and they, own, they owned a restaurant and worked that. So my parents were working 80, 90 hours a week. Um, Ooh. so, and then when I was 12, it was like, okay, I can sit by myself all the time at home or in this rural community, you can start working. I remember driving, um, you know, 12, 13 years old to and from like a dairy farm to bale hay and this, that, and the other. And like, that's all I knew, you know? So I look back at it and people are like, I hear other people's stories and I hear mine. I'm like, I just, all I knew was work. Like all I yeah. knew was good blue collar work. Like that's that. I don't mean like, I wasn't a, you know, <laughs> wasn't working in a sweatshop. I was voluntarily working because I didn't have much. Like my parents, they weren't poor, but we only got what we needed. And yeah. if I needed something in excess, like, you know, baseball was my love as a child. So if I wanted new catcher's equipment, I had to pay for it even yeah, as same. a child. Same. Right. Yeah. Now my parents certainly could try and supplement, but my parents by no means were wealthy. So it's like, Oh, I needed four hundred dollars for a catcher's gear. I had to work all like I had to work all summer just to save the money up to do that, you know. So it it, it instilled in me a very very a very independent work ethic. Like you want to get it done, get it done yourself because that's the only way you're going to get it done. Certainly, kind of thing. So that persisted. Um, you know, that was my childhood, and that kind of really that same that mentality really takes me up to high school. You know, and that's that was my life. My entire life was centered around baseball. Like I lived it, I breathed it. Um, and I was like, you alluded to before, I was a very small child. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and that persisted all through high school too. I was a very, very small kid and it, it, what a blessing it was. And then, you know, what we'll get into probably some other questions where I can elaborate on a bit more, but so I don't just keep talking. I just think that that disposition, the disposition of me being undersized, small, whatever it is. And for whatever reason that, that weighed on me, like some, some people might be very, very small and it doesn't weigh on them, but my intent was to play professional baseball at all costs. And there were no five foot tall professional catchers. So yeah. it really, really wore on me. It created this huge, like bit of resentment, I guess, you know, in a good way, I guess. Um, and that, you know, kind of led to my future, but, uh, so that's just, like just, as a childhood. Yeah. Just give a, a height weight in ninth grade. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> man, I was about 83 pounds and four, four ten. Or I, I didn't, I didn't break, I didn't get the five foot tall until I was a junior in high school. Okay. Got so you, get sir. that. So I wrestled a hundred and so you had to weigh 93 pounds to wrestle 103 in Iowa. I grew up in Iowa wrestling. I wrestled my, most of my childhood all through high school, but my junior and senior year, I got most uh, senior year. And then, so I did not weigh a hundred pounds until I was basically, yeah, until I was a senior, I graduated high school at about 130. And that's when I just started hitting puberty. Um, but yeah, it's like, gives you an idea. It wasn't, I didn't get to five foot or hundred pounds. So I was a junior in high school. Wow. So it, it, I, I was good at developing skill in sport. That's why I tell people like skill acquisition, skill acquisition is not relevant to size. No, like you see like baseball players in Puerto Rico that have incredible skill with absolutely no facilities. Why? Because they repetition, repetition, yeah. repetition. This is an example, you know, sure. as Puerto Rico not having the, the amenities that we do here in the, in, the, in the mainland. But so that's what I mean. Like I look at guys in the spec work community going, hey, I don't care if you're not in the pool. I don't care if you have any things. Like work on your skill, like work on that aspect of it. And then when you get the opportunity, right? You join the Navy or go to college, you get the opportunity with more amenities. Now you just have this really great foundation. Yeah, I imagine so that, your wrestling coach really enjoyed having a junior and senior that was a hundred pound wrestler. And I wasn't my so actually my best friend Corey, <laughs> right? I mentioned he wrestled all through high school, four time state champ in Iowa, wrestled at Iowa. He was my weight, so 103, 112, 119, and then 125. And so I was never the thing I mentioned that I wasn't heavy enough to wrestle at 103 because you have to weigh 93 pounds. Right. So I would, where other guys were cutting weight, like Mitch is always, you know, first fight cutting weight. I would have to eat two breakfasts. Remember those old Doc Martin shoes that were so thick oh, yeah, and heavy? That, that's I had, I'd wear, I had a wool, no kidding, a wool zip coat. I had, cause you know, wrestling practice or like when there was wrestling meets, you had to show up to, you had to dress up mm -hmm. and wear dress clothes in my high school. Yeah. Suits and dress clothes. Yeah, we did that like, for football. That's yeah. how it was in wrestling where I'm from, you know, it was like yeah. dress up for that sport. So I'd show up in my winter clothes because it's a winter sport in my winter clothes with my Doc Martin shoes, second meal. And I'd weigh in. There was one time with all those clothes on when I was a sophomore, I didn't weigh enough to wrestle. I couldn't wrestle 103 because I, I could only get to 91 pounds and I couldn't put any more food in my stomach to weigh in because I didn't weigh enough. Wow. Now, have so, you gone back? I know I'm kind of fast forwarding here a little bit. Have you gone back to people who remember you from high school that haven't seen you in decades and then they see you <laughs> at 240 <laughs> and jacked? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, <laughs> I, I've, ne my 30th, I guess my, my 25th year class high school class reunion is like this last year or something like that. Now I would say that just because it gives you a date of my time. I graduated high school in 96, but I, uh, I remember I, of all those times I deployed all the times, 11 years, I, I only went home once in all those years. And it was just like a random sort of like pass through because I was moving. It was right before selection here. So I was going from San Diego right after deployment. I drove across country to Virginia beach. Um, and it was over mother's day weekend, essentially. And it just so happened. I was passing through and again, my best friend, Corey, I had mentioned, he was, he had just messed random. He's like, Hey man, like what are you up to? I was like, no kidding. Like what a coincidence. I'm literally going to be in Iowa tomorrow passing through. I'll be there for a couple of days and then finish my drive. And he's like, Hey, like no kidding. Like the 15 year high school class reunion. I was like, really? I was like, okay, cool. Like I'll just say hi to everyone. <laughs> Keep in mind, 
when they last saw me, right, I graduated high school at 130 pounds, um, very small kid. At this point, I was 225, tattoos completely covered my body. I had a beard down the middle of my chest, and my hair was in the middle of my back. And so, my, so I'm like, okay, I'll stop by. And so someone in, my, in our grade, my graduating class was only about was 73 students. Someone I graduated with, um, the husband that was married, like, that was basically at their farmhouse, a like, really nice farmhouse, like barn, like they, they were doing it out there. And so that's where we met. And so I remember driving out there, I had my mom's car, whatever, I drove out to there to the meet, to meet my class, right? And I remember parking and getting out of the car, like a residence, and I just had people like literally that I grew up with, like asking me like, hey man, who are you? What are you doing here? I'm like, I'm, this is Jeff, Jeff Nichols. And they're like, oh my, like it happened like <laughs> for pretty much every person in my class was like, who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> 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 they had no idea who I was. No idea. No I can I can only imagine. So, so, let's fast forward a little bit. You uh you made it through high school, um and you you played college baseball, correct? I did. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what was that process like? Going from high school athlete, kind of a small kid, and yeah. trying to get into a college baseball world. Yeah, I was fortunate. You know, I just, again, like I said, I had really good baseball coaches, even though I wasn't a big kid, even in high school. And like my American Legion baseball coach was quite good. So I really had an opportunity to develop skill, enough skill, believe it or not, to get me an opportunity to get a walk on um, at a nationally recognized junior college. So I got on there and ended up getting a scholarship there the year later, because then I grew by the end of my freshman year college, I was 195. I grew nine inches and and almost 100 pounds in a year. Nice. So I really hit, you know, I was 17. I was a little young too. You know, I was a six, I graduated high school. I'm an August birthday. So I kind of like that yeah. real young grade. You know, it was like a grade ahead kind of thing by age, but long story short. Yeah. Junior college was great. Developed a ton, learned a ton, grew, but that chip kind of still remained on my shoulder. But that work ethic persist, persisted. Like I really understood from wrestling and my upbringing because of the struggling. I was like, I can bridge that gap of talent with work to a degree. Oh, absolutely. And, right. And so, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, but I, but I was old enough to recognize that I still needed to get stronger, but I still had, I had developed the ability to acquire skill. I, I didn't, my point is, is I loved the practice because that's all I could do as a little kid is I had to endorse the, I had to embrace the process had to, cause I couldn't make, I couldn't grow. So what mm-hmm. can I do? Improve my skill. Yeah, that's what I was. That's what I thought I could do. And so when I got to college and I put on 100 pounds, the <laughs> skill was there. And then I was like, holy crap, like I can play this game real well. And I'm finally, you know, so that got me a scholarship at Division One school later on at Troy University. And again, that work ethic persisted. And that is when I realized, like, wait a minute, like there's limitations to sport and how much work you can put in it. Because it is so skill derived. Oh, especially too much work will de- erode sometimes that skill because you overtrain. Sure. And I, I tr- overtrain. I was a, like a consummate overtrainer. I was like, I was taking my wrestling activity and putting it into the baseball, and it just got too much. You know, like, then then I had good coaches to go, hey, no, 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 like yeah, pull back a little bit. Hey, let's work more on skill. <laughs> we don't need you running a marathon every single day. All right. So, cause I, I know, no shit did that. I had a, I had a 22, 22 mile loop when I was in, in college. And so when I come home from summer from college, I worked as a, um, at a big uh, racquetball and strength conditioning club. Now I, I worked there, not as a trainer, but like you just as an employee, but every single day and I'm <laughs> folks, this is not something you should be doing. <laughs> so this is why I'm so persistent about don't do this running too much. I ran 22 yeah. miles every single day after my workout for an entire summer. Oh my goodness. Every single day. Damn. Yeah. So I could run, man. I That's could hard. run like the wind. And, yeah. but I didn't know any different. All I knew was work ethic got me to what got me there. In my head was going to keep me there, but I got so sick and so overtrained and my shins were falling. Like I just brutalized myself out of pure, out of pure hate. I was like, yeah. fuck this. This is what's going to get me there. This I can, I'm, I'm tougher than everyone. I had Dan Gable look me in the eye and go, I asked him, I go, how is it that I become the strongest, meanest, toughest guy? And he looked at me and he laughed and he goes, 
there's always somebody stronger, meaner, and tougher. And then he chuckled even more and he goes, or you can be that guy. That's, <laughs> he said that to me when I was in, when I was a freshman in high school, he was yeah. in our wrestling weight room. And I was just like, I, I'm a talkative oh. person. I'm not a, not a shy dude. And every, almost every Sunday for Especially years. Especially when you got Dan Gable in the room. I mean, I saw that man. You don't take advantage of asking yeah. him questions. You're wasting your time. That was my Sunday. That that that's how good my high school wrestling team was. We're national power. So every Sunday, and literally every home wrestling meet, the Iowa wrestling staff was there on the fr front row. Dan Gables and Jim Zaleski, Woo. commentary brands. Like that's who is sitting watching my wrestling meets, right? Who's who of wrestling was at my house. Wow. And so it's like they'd be at our practice. On Sundays, we'd go to Iowa City and practice with them, Ooh. right? So it's like, oh, wow, like, that was my upbringing. Like, I had the most hard-nosed human beings on the planet going, no. You could always be enough. tougher. You not could always enough. be tougher. Not hard enough, yeah. you know? And so for me, being a really small kid, man, what a carrot that was for me. I was like, I'm going to be the toughest human being I can be. And the way I knew to do that by – Growing up in Iowa is work, work, work. So that's always persisted with me. And now it's like a measure of like, okay, I really have to do a better job of like, okay, Jeff, not everyone's you, not everyone's been through your experiences, but <laughs> hmm. we really very much in control of our own success. I believe that. Absolutely. So tell me this, um, at some point in college, you made a decision you were ready to serve and you wanted yeah. to serve you picked the Navy, you picked Navy yeah. SEALs. Why that, why that thought process? What, what happened there? Oh man, probably like everyone else, simply everyone said that it was too hard and it was impossible. And so I had a, I had an absolute drive to make it not, not even difficult. I wanted, I wanted to approach buds as if it was something that I could just laugh my way through it. <laughs> I mean, really like legitimately from a physical standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, I wanted to embarrass, I wanted to emasculate buds <clears throat> truly like that. That was like, I was, I, it was almost like a, every time I'd play baseball, I would make a point to stare at the other opposing catcher, just stare them down. Cause for me, it was like, this is purely a competition. Me versus you. Who's the better catcher on this field period. That's how I approached it. And I did the same thing with buds. I tried to, emotionally inside emasculate the buds instructors. I tried to outrun them, outdo <laughs> them, outlift them, outswim them, everything. And if I could do that to the instructors, I knew that I would be able to do that to the students, my peers. Yeah. And that it was purely a competitive thing, but uh, you know, I, in a healthy way, like that was my own internal fire. Okay. I'm trying to kind of describe Right. Of course that. you were a good team player. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. having it a history of being a teammate with yeah. the sports and it was a, it was a visual that. it was my visual you know it was like what can yeah. i do i can control that fire in me like it, that's what it was it was like a measure of like motivation for me um, yeah i think in one of our tactical fitness reports i made a comment like if you if you always think about winning you never think about quitting you know? right exactly and, exactly and, uh, that that is a mindset that many buds graduates have yeah winning yeah. something you won't win everything but goodness, no, goodness, yeah. no. And, and, yeah. and, that, and that wasn't really, and that wasn't like a blind naivety to me. It was, it was an emotional approach that I took, right? Not a degrading sort of view of other people. Sure. It was like my, like, what can I control? I can control that fire inside of me. Right. And I so, used visuals to do that. Right. So when in this process in college, did you make that? Okay. So when did when, you turn fact, that yeah. switch on? When did you turn yeah. that switch on? Pretty simply, like a, the, 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 the genesis of all of me is this, right? Like, I never really had a, this clear intent to join the Navy. Baseball was this thing that was the, the, this catalyst for great, great work. And then I got to a point where I got to college and it was like, wait a minute, like, I love baseball, mm -hmm. but there's just something about this just being a game. It, it didn't, the fact that I was putting all this heart and love into a game didn't make sense to me a little bit. And so then I found this, you know, ironically enough, I was in speech class. I had my very first cl uh, class in college, one of them was speech. And we had to do a speech on something. And I don't know why. I don't know why, but the, 
Navy SEAL was a topic that I researched or found or came across in the earliest stages of the internet, 1996 and like mm. Netscape and dial up. <laughs> and so I did a report on it. And ever since then, because of like, basically when I did the speech and then the feedback I got from it and the conversation that ensued and then followed, you know, with other, cause I had other guys in the, you know, in the class, my team and whatnot in college. And it was just this, this, the, this constant thought of impossibility or surrounding it that I thought was like, there's tons of people that have done this before. How difficult could this be? And even like the website and the very minimal literature that's out there, like at this time it was just like Marcinko stuff and barely is like red cell and some very <laughs> rare stuff, some Dick couch stuff, but it was like how, and how impossible this is. Right. Right. And so that stuck with me. I was like, Oh, okay. This, this is effort driven, not even skill driven. And it, and it stuck with me all through college. And then I got to a point where I can, here's, here's the punchline, I guess. And the coach I had at Troy university baseball coach was a terrible coach, terrible, terrible baseball coach, terrible human. The coaches I had before that all through baseball were amazing human beings and great coaches. It made me realize how much of a game it was. Mm. I just got to a point where I was done playing like, there's got to be something better and bigger than me. Done playing it games. Just, it just, the SEAL community to me resembled that, that last bastion of pure ethics and hope and hard work and brotherhood and all those things that you don't know if they even exist, but for some reason my heart said that that's where I would find it. And I did. That's exactly what it was. It fulfilled that like aggressive, like, oh, I don't, I can't find my people. I can't express myself. I can't. And I got to the community and I was, I got the buds even. And they're like, well, those aren't my people. Those are my people. It's weird. Like all of a sudden yeah. I was like, man, <laughs> these are my people. And right. then you get through hell week and you're like, oh, these my are people. my people. Yeah. And then you get the teams. You're like, oh, my people. And then you get to like <laughs> the command. I was like, oh, my family. Yeah. Like, this is it. This is where I need to be. And uh, that's, that's kind of the genesis of it. It was like, I just love being part of a team. And I liked, I, I really needed, especially being a catcher, I, being in that sort of, not control in a bad way, but being in the know of that, that team activity was very important. That, and that's what's so cool about the, the SEAL teams is like, you know, when you're in that team element, the communication is extremely good. It's extremely effective. It's extremely, yeah. extremely good. And that was, it's so comforting. And that's why so many guys in the teams, I think are like, well, it's not, it's like, yes, I know we're going to deployment. It's dangerous, but that's not dangerous. I'm dangerous. And you're dangerous because you're with the community of guys that would bleed for you. Yeah. That is what I was missing. And I didn't know I was missing it. Right. So when I got there. I was like, yep, that's what I was missing. <clears throat> and, and, and it provided that for me. That's awesome. So now, okay, let's fast forward. You've uh, decided to join the Navy. You're in the Navy. Um, heading to buds. Um, how did, how did the buds process go? We talked a little bit about your mindset there, but how did that go? The cool thing about your buds class is only easy day. Documented um, it, yeah. Documented it. Uh, it's an Instagram page at yeah. only easy day. And he has a great book picture book yep. um, of that. And it, how great is that to have pictures of all your classmates? It's a, it's a real blessing because it is such it, the guys like you and I or anyone that's been through that selection process knows how rare it is to have a photograph. I have 17,000 <laughs> digital <laughs> photos. That's what a 17,000 some odd number. The book, he chose the, his opinion, his favorite 246. And that was my buds class yeah. number 246. Oh, so it's like, how cool is that? Yeah. If you go through and count it, there's 246 photos. I'm in 97 of them. <clears throat> Damn. So it's like really documented. <clears throat> And, and, and even the photographer now, Richard Schoenberg, is, it, what a good human being he is. He's still around. He's in, in, in uh, Beverly Hills and still keeping contact with him. And man, it, that, that project of passion, he did the same thing from Marine Corps, same book, beautiful book. I mean, done nice. so many things, but, but like, it, yeah, it, what a blessing to have that documented. That's pretty cool. So, um, so what would you say when you were going through BUDS, when was that moment at Buds when you said, you know what, I got this. You know, I, you, everybody comes into it a little bit like, all right, I think I'm ready. Yeah. You know, you may even know you're ready, but 
when, when does it like when was that that moment that he's like all right i just gotta endure this six months and i'm i'm good to go yeah um <clears throat> ironically enough this is gonna i this is i'm certain that many people aren't gonna believe this and i'm certain many people are just gonna write this off as ego <laughs> this is when i met this is when i knew so i we i left i left panama city so i went from or i'm sorry panama city well pensacola so after a boot camp, I went to Pensacola because I, at the time there was no SO rate. Right. I was a PR a parachute rigger. I thought that was a, a total of nine week course. I thought, Hey, that might help me be useful for the team. So I'll pack parachutes. So I went to the short A school, which is good. It was a warmer climate. So I graduated boot camp in great place uh, to train October. I think. Yeah. No, October, no, I did, December 21st is when I graduated boot camp. So got down there. It was warmer. Nice. Good idea. Got down there got through no issues, um, flew out to Coronado. It was, it was an evening flight. I remember it was a, it was a late flight, it was <clears> weird. I just, it just felt odd. And I remember the song that was even playing when we landed. I just, it's odd, like it was so surreal. That's why I was saying like, this is a very real moment for me that I very, very much remember. I remember driving across Coronado Bay Bridge after being in the USO in San Diego and I was just in civilian clothes and I was in the USO and the person that was in there civilian, she's like, you're checking into buds, right? And I was like, yeah. She goes, you need to be in your dress whites. And I was like, oh shit. I had never, no one told me that. Right. So I changed, went to the bathroom and I changed in my dress mm -hmm. whites and it was like 1130 at night. It was real late. And so I remember, you know, getting a shuttle, they drove me over the bri bridge and I'm like, oh my shock and awe like i'm here nervous whatever get into the buds car quarter deck and it's a ghost town it's midnight like on a tuesday or something right no one's around and uh took a long time for the od to show up just because he's doing his rounds at like three o'clock in the morning finally got checked in and i was in my dress whites and he's just like whatever <laughs> like it was like why did i put these on so he's like here just here's a key go in a room go sleep for a couple hours he goes come back and get me like at 8 30 and i'll get you checked in or whatever so I went and it's like, just stayed in my dress whites, honestly. I took some off and like kind of just, I slept for a minute in this open bed, this open bay. And uh, I remember just mm -hmm. like really, really, sir, I woke up, walked across to where all the feet are. It was like 8.40 in the morning. I was going to be early in the uniform and trying to like, oh my, Bud's constructor's like, this is real, man. Getting dropped down and shit. Like <laughs> this is happening. I didn't fuck what was going on. Cause I got there at 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, what is going on here? I'm getting dropped down. I don't know where to go. I don't know like where I'm not supposed to walk. And it was like super nerve wracking. And I got through the quarter deck. The OD was same guy. And he's like, Hey, the, give me a quick sort of do this. Don't do that. Whatever. Here's some paperwork, sign this, whatever. Here's your room key. And I had my sea bag. He goes, you got, he goes, you got everything in your sea bag, right? That you need. And I was like, yeah, I got all the uniforms and sat in the other. And he goes, yeah, don't worry about it. He goes, he goes, we'll get you moved across the way here in a couple of days. But right now just be, be in your, like when we just had the blue, the light blue t-shirts and like the, the Dickies type pants, you know? Yeah. And he goes, just, just wear that around. If you got it. I was like, okay, no, no issues. So long story short is this, this is when I knew. So when I locked out of the quarter deck, I walked back in my room and I was like, well, shit, he said, I don't need any of this anymore. So I grabbed my sea bag. It was still completely packed from coming from a school and boot camp, completely packed. I said, Oh damn. I said, like, my pea coat was the very first thing packed <laughs> the very bottom. So I had to pull everything out of my, my sea bag, pull my pea coat out. I hung it up, put everything back in the sea bag. I walked outside the building in the dumpster and I threw everything in the dumpster. <laughs> Every Navy uniform I had right in the dumpster, except for the one I was wearing and my pea coat to include yeah. my dress uniforms. I was like, I'm done with this boot camp. I'm done with this Navy shit. I'm here. That was it. That was okay. it. You're Never look game back. on. Never look back. And that's game true. On. Like as, as much ego as that is, is like eh. the reality is, is I'm telling you right now, Stu, every single day from that point, the only thing that I had in my head was like, cause I've had a history of foot issues cause of baseball, just always being on my instep as a catcher. Sure. But I never had problems after that. Like ever since I stopped wearing baseball spikes, my foot issues went away. Yeah, no kidding. And you I, know, yeah. I had the same thing. I had ankle problems going in, always spraining my ankles and football and rugby. And once I wore those boots to run in all the time, I never had ankle problems. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's that's, it. So. yeah I, I would say I was probably in that mindset as well. Um, but mainly just I, I just prayed I wouldn't get hurt. That, yeah. that, was, that was my biggest worry was not getting hurt. I remember they actually, you know, we do like the peer reviews and buds. I remember a question was asked that we filled it out. One of the questions was, 
this kind of like, it, what is it that got you through? What is like, what was the thought process of what got people through? And we actually discussed it at the end of buds as a class with the cadre in the, in the paperwork. It's like, what do we, what's this question about? So like, we need some clarity. He goes, all right, this is what we're saying. It's like, for you guys now that you know you're gonna graduate, what, give us, if you can give us a couple sentence sort of like uh, reasons why you stay, like what is it, what was the motivational thing? And it was like almost unanimous, people wrote the exact same thing after we had this discussion. And it was, no one approached it as if it was voluntary. Like they were there to do it, not to try it. And, right. and it was like, none of us were surprised. We're like, were you surprised? No. And then you can openly speak with like, yes, I know what you're talking about. It's like, I never thought this was voluntary. I was never going to quit. Like there was nothing that was going to stop me. But having that communication with people that really believe that and truly like you're right there, you're, you're an hour from graduating buds. Yeah. You can have this conversation. And, but, but, we were having this conversation 27 weeks prior in PTRR. <laughs> the nice. same guys were. Nice. And, 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 and that's like, that has, seems like every Buds class. There's like, I always tell people when you show up to Buds, get around people that you know are going to make it through. Because if you show up and you're around a bunch of people that's quitting, you pick the wrong group. And, and, and that, like, I, of everyone I surrounded myself with at Buds from like the first day, only one person quit. Granted, I didn't have a harem. I'm yeah, saying yeah, like sure. there was like yeah. five or six guys. I was like, man, I just got a good feeling about these five dudes. And four of four of five of us made it. You know, it yeah. was just, that's what I mean. And then yeah, after you, Hell Week, you're like, oh, tell. I can't get it. You can definitely tell there's a mindset of people that are going to make it going in. Yeah, there's the triers. They're super flamboyant and louder than everyone else. They're the, the, the overcompensation of E, like, oh my God, I got to be as louder than everyone because I'm trying to overcompensate for my lack of, of, of uh, um, motive personal, or like personal real confidence. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it, 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 it's, it's a really, really cool thing. I always tell people like buds is the most democratic thing I've ever been through. And hmm. man, what a really cool experience that was because it's so truthful. It's such a truthful event. And yeah, it, it, it's so awesome. So tell me this, what, what do you think that you did? that prepared you the most physically mentally you had you had the edge obviously but what do you think you know to, to meet the standards to achieve beyond the standards what do you think part of your journey in training that you did that you felt helped you the most or did you actually see progression while at buds yeah no i think it's one of those things it's like you're out it's i'm going to take credit for something that i you can't take credit for, right? That's what I mean. It's like the best thing that serves me and it's probably something we tell our athletes all the time. I'm sure you and I do. And I, I know we've said it. It's one of the most common thing I tell young guys is like play as many sports as you can growing up. Like be as diverse athletically as you can be a decathlete. Not, not literally, but just play all the sports you can as a young, young adult that will physically develop you that will make you more resilient. It'll make you more athletic It'll make you more durable. It'll make you all those sort of things. And a team player. Absolutely. Because you can't get by, you can't get through buds by yourself. No, Period. sir. Period. No. Yeah. And, you know, was I going through sports all through my childhood in high school for buds? No. No. But that's what I mean. Like, it, my lifestyle that was blessed upon me, that was supported by my loving family and friends, created this this process of like I was basically training for buds not literally at all folks but since I was a child like yeah. going on the farm when I was a, when I was 12 years old to work every day because that's how I had to make money right taking getting myself up for school every day because my parents were already long gone for like those things and then getting myself to practice on my own accord every day making sure my uniform was clean because my parents were gone to work I had to do all that stuff and that, that lifestyle that was blessed upon me where in hindsight or at the time, I was like, man, I'm, I'm struggling. Like, no, 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 no. You are creating a vessel for success in life. And it, whether it's buds or, or whatever it may be, it's just, man, be active, get out there and, and, and experience the life. Because when you're young, younger, you don't have a lot of responsibility a lot of times. 
because your parent, a lot of people do have parents that care for them. So take advantage of it. Like yeah. not advantage of your parents, but man, if your parents are paying the bills, mm -hmm. go experience life. Yeah. Yeah. Thrive in the struggle. That's for sure. You betcha. Thrive in the struggle. So, okay. So we got through buds. Where, where'd you go after uh, buds? So I was still team five for two deployments. And then after that, I screwed, screwed for dev group. Yep. Um, spent 11 years in the Navy, eight years at the command here. Um, got out in 2016. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a really good route because, you know, we all SEALs or most SEALs. And I know it's like you go in to go do work. And a year to the day, a year to the day that I, I my very first, so two years of the day, two years to the day that I joined the Navy, I deployed for the first time. Is that math right? Because I deployed October 1st, maybe it was a year to the day. Anyways, the point is, is <clears throat> I, I had a very interesting sort of path too, I guess, because because of the time I was graduating BUDS and SQT, that was when they condensed all the teams for GWAT. So they started reorging deployments and taking like, well, we're not sending guys out of the Philippines. We're going to pull some of those teams. And you know what I mean? All yep. that big reorg you're aware yeah, of. Yeah, everybody went. I was right in the yeah. middle of that. And yeah. so I actually got pulled out of SQT a couple of weeks early um, because when I you know, graduated BUDS, it was like, oh, you're going to still team five. This is their deployment cycle. This is the timeline you're on. Well, in the middle of SQT, they should condense a timeline. So SEAL Team 5 is like, we need to grab our dudes early because we need to send them to minimal qualification schools so they can deploy, right? So they pulled me and a few other guys early because then we jumped into the workup with SEAL Team 7. So we did mountain shawls, so we could do the CQB mountain stuff. So you could, and then we did some driving courses in Fallon. And then I deployed immediately. So I didn't even have a normal workup. I had like a seven week workup as a new guy Woo! with a different team just to deploy. And I got to Iraq, not even even meeting my team, most of them. And I got there and like, Oh, you're the limo driver for the president and the prime minister of Iraq. Like a new guy. I'm like, Holy shit. So I was instantly like, you're working. It was great. I had this responsibility throwing me right away. <clears throat> so long story short, that deployment, seven months came home and then they're like, Hey, you're going to sniper school right now, pack your stuff. So me and Morgan Luttrell, we packed our stuff right away. Boom. We went to sniper school four months into that. And then like 11 days after that, I was deployed again. So they recondensed the timeline again. What year was, was this? Like, like 2006. Yeah, that was busy yeah, 2005 time. and six. So it was like, hey, no workup. You just, we hit some very abbreviated workup spots that we did because like I was already a one platoon guy and been through it. I hadn't even really been through a workout workup because I did it with SEAL Team 7. So I did land warfare quickly and they pushed us to sniper school four months left. It left. And then we had the Surtex, like the FTX before deployment. So I went right from sniper school to an F, the SEAL Team 5 FTX, deployed immediately, like a week later. So two weeks after sniper school, workup, deployed. Now, then, now, now tell me this, whenever you were at uh, SEAL Team 5 and probably what was probably the busiest Yep. time for seal operators did you find and, and you can compare this you know because you were at, at dev group for a while too you find the uh the op tempo for your seal team five was kind of similar to what you did yeah it was because of the timing you know it's like it's one of those like perfect storms where the the teams there was so much i'm doing air quotes here so much work that needed to be done that it, that's they that's why they didn't you know they pulled everyone back together and did the reorg right because the whole the Afghanistan and Iraq was at the same time simultaneously, so you know it's it was very very interesting time because it it was so busy funding was much higher than for SEAL Team Five too because of that was the, the the national mission like mission was protection standing up that new democracy right so all this money, all these assets, all these availabilities came into the to SEAL Team 5 and other teams. We deployed, we had all this stuff going on. It was, it was good, it was good. Like it was, it was a time in the white side teams, we'll call it that was in abundance. And that's, it's not that you don't always have things needed, but there was just a tremendous abundance that, you know, Dev Group and other units had always been used to. Right. So it was, it was, the transition was very unique for me because I had all these, all this abundance at SEAL Team 5 um, for two deployments. I got done with that, deployed right away to Ramadi. Again, the hot spot, the hot spot, the best place to be. 
did four months or it actually was longer than that. I, my son was born. So I came back for a little, so about, about five and a half months I was deployed for that. But here's the crazy thing too, is like, mm. what an awesome employment, like tons of action, tons. I was a sniper in that zone. It was busy in a good way, everything we want to do. So I get back to my second deployment, 16 days later, I started green team. So I had to drive across country. I had to do all that sort of stuff in a very short condensed time period. Wow. And 16 days later, I was in green team. Now, did you feel you were physically ready for green team? Was that pretty challenging physically? Yeah. It, so I, I think for me, the, the fortunate side was because I was such a good swimmer. Um, my, my, me growing up as a child, like a very competitive swimmer. I didn't swim at all for, man, I, I, I literally, from buds till my green team screener, I didn't swim once. You're talking probably, what, five years? It was two and a half years. Two and a half years. Okay, <laughs> yeah, wow, almost, that's almost, quick. Yeah, so that's, what, so that's what I'm saying, those condensed timelines, because usually it's a six-year process. Right. I got, from the time I joined the Navy, the time I was at the command was only four years. Wow. So, and that's usually, it's usually six years after you get to the team. So it's usually about seven years timeline. And I did it in just under four. Um, but, but it wasn't, that was because the detailers and the reorg and stuff, it just really expedited my time to get the opportunity to go. And uh, it was, it was very interesting because it was like, I got there and it's like, Hey, you've done two deployments. You've got sniper school and you're just, you're young. It's like throw you right into the command, right into the mix. And I was, and I was, turning and burning constantly so I didn't you know a lot of guys understandably with that seven year five six seven year window they got to put their life on hold to go through that selection process like my life had already been on hold for two and a half years right I've been on deployment after deployment two deployments back to back like I didn't have a family I didn't have it so I was like boom right into the command so it I I had this very unique sort of quick timeline and now in hindsight I go wow that that was really I was super blessed because not a lot of guys get that opportunity, let alone that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, especially like guys that you graduated with that might have been Corman, for instance. Kevin, Kevin Lace, right? So the yeah. last punter in the book. Yeah. I deployed three times before he even deployed once. Right. Because he, he went through all the that 18 long Delta course, stuff. Corman school, yeah. 18 Delta, all that stuff, yeah. right? And then you had guys, one guy went to SDV, an officer, right? The officer from uh, in my bud's class. So, right. I get, you know, I get five deployments in before he gets one because he's wow. got to go through all those, the long, he's got to go through the long SDV course yeah. plus his, uh, you know, the, the post buds, the officers go do their, uh, leadership. Yeah. Right. So he had to do that. And then he had to do an entire 18 month SDV course. And then, you know, so it's yeah. like by that point, I don't, you know, the 18 months post graduated in buds, I already deployed twice. Yeah. There's some stories like that, that are, you know, guys, it just happens, you know, and, and yep. it, it's a, I guess a circ, series of circumstances, part luck, part yeah. right time, right place. Purely outside of my control, yeah. which yeah. now I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> yeah. good. It was good. You know, it was good. But so that's kind of takes us, you know, I got to the command and then there, you know, about all I'll say about that place is yeah. you're as busy as you want to be. And that's, but that's the only rule. It's like, if you're not busy, you're not going to be there. Like, right. That's the thing is like, you're, you're a con in a very healthy, healthy way. You're at a constant, like your peer group. It's, 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 a, it's such a physical, like, or a, a competitive challenge at some point you in, in a good way. Like, and it needs to be that it's like what makes Ford good Chevy, right. Kind of thing. Like right. you get to the command. There aren't a lot of leadership positions. And it was a bunch of guys trying to get there. And so a bunch of good dudes, a bunch of really yeah. competent guys, a bunch of guys that are willing to, you know, work hard and do those sort of things. So the mentorship and the leadership that I had not, I, I was super blessed because there's a lot of horror stories of guys with good, with bad leadership in, in the teams at times, you know, yeah, it happens. you know, the deal. And I, not always, not, not super common, but like, it's not indifferent than like a, a coach like for the Cubs that isn't liked or something, right? No different. Not, sure. not everyone's perfect. But long story short is, man, the mentors and the leaders and the LPOs and the officers that I had, I'm in, man, I had the best leadership, period. I, I don't have any complaints about my leadership and the teams, man. It, my, my only complaint is like I probably underserved them at times, but 
it, not because of my leaders, man. I had amazing mentors. So, and it just continued to persist when I got to the command. And it was, it was, it was awesome. I, my time in the, my time in the community is as good as anyone that I've ever heard of. Oh, of absolutely. I've, it's, it's kind of unheard of to be mm -hmm. honest with you. I mean, there, the, the time between nine 11 and 2015, you know, was probably been <laughs> yeah. some yeah. of the, the busiest like I, times for. Like I, I, I remember very clearly at one point at the command, we had dieted done like, four deployments in a very short period of time and they're like all right <laughs> no kidding the ceo is like you guys stop like no more work for like a couple of days because you, we are backlogged for four deployments on awards so we had a command stand no kidding we had a command stand down command the wow. ceo was like no more work everyone write their evals and fit reps for the next for the last four years we did that's all we did for a week because wow. we were four deployments behind on wards so that we wow. i mean that award ceremony oh i'm talking must like have been. I mean, there was 65 bronze stars given out probably seven silver stars like four legions of merit like i mean i'm talking like we're the most decorated military unit in the in modern history and i sat through it going i know somebody who has seven silver stars seven isn't that nuts and it's not like it's not like the community's like going, hey, this thing happened. It's like, no, 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 no. We're talking like a four day shootout, like cast, like guys on I, I know a dude on horseback. I know a guy on, on horseback called Cass on himself, a, a, a combat controller. Because it, 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 troops in contact were coming out of it. And he's just like, I remember him drop on my paws, drop on my paw. Right now, he's like, what? I'm on the strobe. Turns the strobe on. He's like, drop it on the strobe. And he's being chased on horseback no kidding like i've seen some stuff and heard some stuff where like holy shit this is really happening that's for real man so like you hear stories like that and i'm like man I, I stood on the shoulders of giants like for real like heroes like real life heroes i gotta live with work with them yeah and man man it was cool getting to see those guys live like they did so so okay that's incredible um so eventually you make a decision like, you know what? I have done about all I can do and I'm, I got to get out of the Navy. Um, what was that process? Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, without getting too much in the emotional side of it, I think, uh, I ask people, I say, well, you know, people, what's the best thing about your Naval career? And I get, well, the best thing about my Naval career is that I decided to do it. I said, the second best thing that I ever did for my naval career was when I recognized when I was done, that I stepped away. Because I think, I think with love and with the respect that I have for the community, and if I do love the community as I do, the best thing I can do for that community is leave it in a place where I don't resent it. And because of all the deployments that I did, I chose to, like, I, that's my decision, right? Like, the, you're like, well, you're in the Navy. It's like, I, you can still, at a certain point, folks, you, you, if you get in that community, you realize how active you really want to be. You can be that to a degree. Um, and I got to a point where I was like, man, I had a son. Um, I, I had emotionally bit off more than I could chew at times professionally. And I got to the point where in, in, in deployment started getting less and less and this change is going on the war and the politics. It got to a point where I just, I didn't feel like my heart was there like it was the, in the previous. It, it, and it wasn't. It, 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 this is like me trying to give you a sense of what I was going through, but my heart wasn't in it. And yeah. I didn't feel like if I did another nine years, that that nine years of service would be what the Navy, specifically the SEAL teams, specifically the command I was at, deserved much more than that. They deserve better out of me. And I didn't feel like I was going to be able to, I didn't want to give, I was tired. I was, I yeah. was just done. And I stepped away and there was a real rough transition for me, yeah. but man, like I'm glad I did that. And, and now it's led me to what, what I do now where I, I try my best to leave it better than I found it, you know, to that community that um, has really blessed me with so much. So, well, 
I, as I recall, you were kind of getting out, or you were kind of almost done with deployments or done with deployments. And then, you know, Spec War and SOCOM were creating this human performance yep. program. Yeah, which timing were, again. Which, yeah. which you were a part of as well. And did you find that to be kind of like a catalyst towards your transition? Yeah, now? yeah. So interestingly enough, like about 2009, the CEO of the command, and he was previously Warcom, um, Captain Van Hoosier. He, uh, what a great human being he is, and great leader he was. He he had the clout in this idea, like, hey, we need to do better, and it literally coincided with the time where I became a little bit more senior at the command and a background exercise physiologist, and going, hey, man, we're really underserviced, but we have all this money. Let's let's put it into this idea that. I thought I had kind of right, but then I realized we got a new CEO and it was like, wow, he, this is a real initiative of his. So I actually got to meet with him quite often and, and basically we spitball back and forth. And he's like, all right, well hire me somebody. I'm like, okay, <laughs> kind of thing. So I was part of the hiring board for the human performance program within the command. And so I was interviewing people and going and scouting. I was flying around the country. Like they didn't know I was interviewing them for a job. We were, we were trying to find information to build a program. So we found our guy, Mark Stevenson, who's now at the Lions. Yeah. And we interviewed and all those sort of things. And what, what happened was like, because of my background as an exercise physiologist prior, and it just, the perspective and then the, the leadership at the time recognized that, hey, this might, you, your perspective would be valuable because none of us have ever had that, right? Never built a program, never managed one. And so I, again, this is back to my mentors and leadership. They had enough trust in me to go, yeah, let this guy figure this thing out. We'll give him some rope. We'll give him more rope if he doesn't screw this up. And then we'll give him a bunch of rope if he's, if he's doing the right thing. And so the course of about 15 months, that was what my primary job was, was, um, well, so for about five years, it was a collateral duty. And then it became a full-time duty. My last about 14, 15 months in the Navy was like, that's what you're going to do full time. Nice. And, and it really was a really cool time because it taught me a lot about actually the community. Like, okay, you can't just walk into a room with SEAL team members and go, you're doing it all wrong. Fix it. You're right. <laughs> because you're going to be like, no, because what got me here, like all their heads, like what got me here is what's going to keep me here kind of thing. And, and I was like, okay, I got to try a different approach to this because, you know, like guys, SEAL team, got, SEAL team members are extremely motivated but understandably, they're, they're extremely cautious, too, because people that, at that place, it's like if you're the New York Yankees, every sporting goods manufacturer in the world is like trying to get you to try some of their new device. So when you are the, the department head of the human performance program for that SEAL team, sure. my goodness, man, like everyone's trying to get you to try this new this, and, and they know you have money. So they're not just trying to sell you foam rollers. They're trying right. to sell you $300,000, like, isolation tanks and like, like whatever kind of stuff. And so you're just like, that was my initial thing was like filtering through the nonsense. And so that's kind of how I learned a lot about initial being, being initially objective about, Hey, what does it, does, does this device work? Right. We are always talking about does does this device work or what heart rate monitor, like what's the benefit of foam rolling. And so I had to discover all of those things. And the reason why was because in the United States government, typically, especially in that part, that, that place that is very well ran and managerially. It's like, you can't procure something from the government unless you can, that company can prove that it can deliver what it advertises. Like, right. like oh, this thing cures cancer. Like, we'll prove it. Like, hey, this thing measures X. Show me the algorithm and the technology. And then if they can, then it can go into procurement. So I, like Mark Stevenson was always like, Jeff, you got to be more objective. You got to be more objective. You just can't believe what people say and like, cause you want it to. And so it made me very, made me question even more yeah. <laughs> as, as you and many other people were aware of. I was like, I'm on why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Yeah. I, so, I give Mark Stevenson full credit for creating the term tactical fitness he, before, he, before, he before he went it. there. Before he went there, he was at an SCA and he created the tactical strength and conditioning yep. program. You betcha. Which you and I have met through. Um, and, and Years, yeah. That's how yeah. you really know you and I know each yeah. other so well. And um, so he, he is, he really, Brilliant. yeah, brought a human performance standard to a 
really a program that my high school athletic program was a better training facility than my SEAL team when I went. Yeah. Now, this was yes. early 90s when I went to my SEAL team. So, I mean, I actually had a better high school program as yeah. far as athletic trainers and coaches and all that, you know, compared to what we had at, you know, SEAL team compound. Yeah. We shared a weight room with SEAL team four, right? That was probably as big as my basement. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> with a bunch yep. of nautilus machines yeah you know? so it was it was a mess a little bit um, things have changed so sure. things have changed and, and you were a part of that transition which is very impressive because last i checked that contract is about a 500 million dollar human yeah. performance contract yeah. just for socom it was when we ran when we when it was awarded it was called the potif the preservation yep. of the force it was 998 million dollars and that's what i managed there with the, not just me but like that yeah. was the package like i was the active duty managerial position so right. we had a civilian components then each of the you know military sort of internal groups had a had someone i would coordinate with to get them gear information whatever it is training um so it worked out i was the liaison but i was like the communicator i was like saying hey training wants to do this squadron x and you go, why they go, why the fuck do we want to do that? I go, guys, listen, this is why you want to do it from a SEALs perspective. I go, okay, we want to do that. And so I was the guy going, well, why did like trying to explain to them, you need sure. to wear this heart rate monitor on this mission. You need why? that. Because yeah. this is going to get you better food. Well, how? Because if we can say that the caloric demand that the cafeteria overseas is providing isn't giving you enough calories on this nine kilometer. 14,000 foot, seven hour hop, like walk. Now we can reach back to the command and you spend our money to supplement it with better food. So it was like, this is how we make this yeah. argument. It's like, it's like, why do I want to wear this stupid heart rate monitors that my body armor is hitting it? Yeah. The means of the end folks. And so I was that guy. And so that's why I'm so like, people go like, why do I do this? Like, we'll measure it. Yeah. Science. Because you can't make change. And you're certainly not going to convince leadership to make change if you don't have data. Got to have numbers. But we don't want to just collect data for the sake of data. So it put me in a really good position as being the conduit where Mark Stevenson was my, my, was, was my, my mentor. And he's like, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. I would go guinea pig it and go, hey, Mark, this isn't going to work for this. And we tweak it and go, okay, now let's share it with the community. Nice. And so he really, really, really taught me so much about communicating at a better level to leadership to convince. Sure. But still be at the operational level and be, Hey, you're doing it. And, and guys want to, like, that's a good skill. Be, be, and it's, be, it's be an example. When you're bringing on that kind of change, you need that guy. You bet. Yeah. You were that guy. So that, yeah. that's impressive. And congrats on that one. Cause that's, that's not an easy job to fill. So eventually you got out. Yeah. Right. And so now let's talk about what's going on now with <laughs> Jeff Nichols. Yeah. So again, just like what we just talked about, it was like, now there's, it's been a couple of years now. I got in 2016 and now it's how do I take, cause I, I got this really amazing advice that I didn't know I got. I happened to be standing there with one of my closest friends, the godfather of my son, Marcus Luttrell. He was talking to the master chief of SEAL team five. So we're backing up a couple of years to make a point. Marcus was very torn and he's having so much pain. So it was right before he got out and his last deployment with us in Ramadi, he's just so uncomfortable. His intestines were just a mess. And so many pills and to manage the pain. Long story short is Pete Nazcheck was the master chief and what a great human he still is. And he said to Marcus, he's like, man, I know you're torn up about this. He goes, but you will do more good for the community outside of it than you're able to do right now in. And I remember hearing that like almost like I shouldn't have heard it because he was just, Marcus was real sad. And Marcus isn't going to mind me telling this because it, it just, Marcus is such a good human too. But I remember hearing that in my head later on going, okay, I left the community on my accord for the most part, kind of, you know, some mistakes I made and, and some things I would change a little bit at the time. And now in hindsight, I look at it and I go, huh, how is it that I best positively affect the community that has done so much for me that I love, I appreciate. Now, I certainly have an opinion and I have some voice about some things, but now I really feel like, especially like with you, what you do with, with respect to what you've done for so many years, like 
the positivity that you inject into the population that has done so much for you that you love and appreciate. And you have people in there still that serve with you, right? Like mm -hmm. Mitch Bradley and whatnot, guys like that is like, how do we continue to serve those people? Well, we do it by hopefully getting them better qualified, better fit, more emotionally stable human beings through our teachings and mentorships. So we can really infuse that population with more positivity, more knowledge, um, and more capabilities once they stay in and they themselves become leaders. Now they can better appropriate their knowledge for training and emotional, physical, whatever it is. Like, you know, and because of all those people that you've trained over those years, it's like, you know, once someone has been six years, eight years, 10 years, and they themselves have been training properly because of your teachings. And now they're the team leaders. And now they're saying, no, 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 this is a better way to train. And now we infuse that knowledge in the community in a positive way because we know the community is so busy, so saturated with its own ta technical, tactical stuff. Some people obviously don't have that knowledge. So let's, we're trying to get them, you know, as best we can. I'm, I'm trying to just help as many people with knowledge as possible into that community because it's, it's, uh, I relate to it just like you do. You yeah, know? sure, sure. Hey, and it's nice to feel like you have a foot in the door still. You bet. You know, yeah. And yeah. not, not try to overstep my bounds in any way, but at the same time, I don't try to get people to buds. I try to get people through buds. Yeah. So, yep. or whatever job that is, you know, I think as a trainer, I think it's smart for us to diversify and just go all tactical professions because yep. I know you work with police officers and firefighters and yep. plot teams and, you know, all military branches. So wh where can people find out more information of, about what you offer? Yeah. The best place to is Instagram is uh, Jeff CSCS. That's where, it's kind of, I'll call, it's more of an advertisement platform, if you will, an information platform. My website is performancefirstus.com. That website really is, is starting to become a, a much better resource because now the membership side and the videos and we're growing that and nice. moving into a new facility here, hopefully very soon that expands our opportunities to bit better video quality because of space and whatnot. So that's really what it is, is just like you, like, where, how can I best provide resources for the masses that really are useful and a system to go along with it and some methodology and, and, and it's like that mutual work that you and I have together and things and like the other people that we have, it's like, we're all in this together. Sure. We really are. There's enough people to be training for everyone. There's not any yeah. possessiveness of it. No. Um, it's a big world out there in fitness. Betcha. You betcha. And uh, people find me for all reasons from the 50 year old that needs to lose 50 pounds to the 18 year old that I'm trying to talk out of going to buzz because he's, <laughs> yeah. cause he's not yeah. ready yet. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, you know, I, I think that's, that's what we are, you know, Stu, like, I think I look, look back at your life and look back at my life. I'm like, what, what have I always been? I've always been a teacher and I embrace that. I really have embraced that. And it's good because like you, you see, I know, I know it. I've stopped myself in my tracks a couple of times and people I've trained at seminars we've done or in person, you're just like, man, it's like, you're looking at yourself 20 years before going, that's me. <laughs> you're like, cause it's happened a couple of times, right? That me I've identified. It's like I, six months later, the dude messaged me. He's like, yeah, I just made it through hell week. No problem. I love it. Yeah. That was me, you know? And then I know I see that in him and I, you, that the energy that the guys that come train with you and that me, the energy they bring, man, it's, oh, it's like, makes you feel young. It, it's that it gives you hope for the future because there are people that are willing to join in any of the tactical professions yes. right now. And we're still in wars for the foreseeable future. Um, we've got a constant terrorist threat on the homeland though. It's, not a little bit weird now crazy yeah, right, it's a little yeah, bit different a little bit downplayed right now but you know at the same time you always have to be ready and That's our guys that we train are those guys that are going into those yeah. jobs to be ready and uh i take it just as seriously as you do yeah yeah you know, and um yeah and that's what i mean like credit really goes where credits do is that like you you really and even like don shipley to a degree like the precedence has been set 
So it's incumbent upon us, me and other people to like, let's continue to make it better. And you're doing that too. It's not like you're, you're not promoting the exact same programs right now as you were 10. They've evolved. And sure. I think that that's, that's the idea too, is we are evolving with the community that really is ready to evolve with it. Like, Cause they're changing and adapting finally. Kind of like people say the tactical strengthening pop tactical strength and conditioning population resembles. And these are from old coaches, like 40 years of coaches, like going, Hey, the NCAA in 1984 to 87, when co- there became strength coaches was like, why do we need all these guys? Now every university in the country is like, no, we wouldn't do without them. And so the tactical population is now going, oh, this avenue of tactical strength conditioning, it's its own animal and it needs to be treated as its own profession and it needs to be staffed and funded because they are the, because the revolving door of leadership that's in the military, every couple of years, someone goes, comes and goes. Well, the civilian population can be a mainstay oh, as long as they build rapport and trust. Yeah, they got to do that. And now, and that's, and, and that's the tough thing, even in that GS world, but you know what? you and I are here to stay. We're a mainstay. <laughs> like, that's what I mean. Like yeah. we, in a, in the correct way, we're the, we're a mainstay and we're a reliable source. And, and, and that's what we want to provide. And that's why I want to continue to provide. Cause it, shoot, if, if I've done half a good a job as you've done over the last 19 years, then damn, like that's a positive impact to the community. I appreciate. So that's, well, that's you. my goal. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And, um, what, what a great story. And I, I've neglected to ask you earlier to do this. Um, um, and I apologize for that. No, because no, uh, no. <laughs> uh, you have been so helpful with the tactical fitness reports that it is pretty much the Stu and Jeff show, <laughs> you know, and I just, you know, whenever I get an idea, I shoot it past you and you make our show smarter. So thank you so much for everything that, that you <laughs> add to, um, you know, to the tactical fitness report and you know what you're doing personally as well so we'll keep it fun i mean that's the point of it too right like it, it's fun yeah like, i always tell people like when it comes to fitness or whatever training it's like what should be the first rule do what you enjoy and and i enjoy doing this i know Stu does and it's like what a blessing like we yeah. get to do something we really enjoy or passionate about to a community that we love yeah so the community is plural, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, all right, Jeff. So thank you so much for doing this two through and after show. Always. Um, I'm actually, uh, with all this extra spare time that we have these days, <laughs> I'm trying to like, just get as many people right? as I can to do this show and just you never know where it may grow in the next, uh, Heck yeah. next few months. <laughs> you betcha. Yeah. I'll always be, if you need me to make any contact with you, like with somebody, because I think probably like, yeah, like Morgan and Marcus Tro, any of those guys. Yeah, we get all kinds up. of people in their journey. So, hey, Jeff, thank you for your time. You and gotcha. uh, we're going to wrap this up. And uh, once again, you can find more information about Jeff at performancefirstus.com. And his uh, Instagram is Jeff CSCS. Uh, so check those out and you'll get plenty of information from there. You got it. All right. Thank you, Jeff. You appreciate it, Sue. We'll see you.